the RB20 side pod retains a form that maximizes the regulated undercut area dimensions off the second iteration of the 2023 RB19, although the RB19 has the intake on top of the side pod instead. On the RB19, what this does is it leaves the undercut without any compromises. The RB20 has two air intakes within each undercut instead. That, on a technicality, would be a little bit of a compromise, but they have been very calculative in maintaining undercut performances. Directional airflow closest to surface area move at a lower rate than those further away from it. It seems that what Red Bull Racing has done on the RB20 to minimize side pod air intake compromising undercut performance is to place narrow dimension intakes along the X and Y axis. That would be horizontal and vertical intakes in the undercut surface area capturing only the lower velocity section of airflow as this is less influenced by surface area and will continue to maintain this energy for undercut performances. The air in this region would still have high pressure so it would be forced into these air intakes providing powerful airflow. The side pod undercut is a powerful design that accumulates oncoming air and creates high pressure. Think Ventury where the air comes in and starts to accelerate airflow velocity. This high pressure is then discharged as airflow that is of higher velocity or a powerful blast, targeted at sections of a Formula 1 car to further enhance downforce or ground effect performance. One area it works on is the floor edges. The flick on the floor edges is clear evidence of this as it has always been positioned where the primary undercut ends, an area of high velocity. This flick begins to take form literally underneath the floor or the underfloor so increasing air velocity in this region would also increase low pressure underneath a Formula 1 car. This part of the floor edge is always very detailed with all Formula 1 cars from this era and this is a reflection of how important it is. They don't use all off of the undercut's energy for this. It continues downstream to influence a reduction in rear wheel wake that interrupts parts of the rear section of a Formula 1 car that generates downforce. This high velocity discharged off the undercut is also low pressure and would influence overall side pod airflow downwards from the top of the side pod. This would increase air velocity designed to further enhance beam wings performance which has a crucial role in scavenging the tunnel exits to further reduce tunnel pressure. On the RB20, it is interesting that they have changed the intake from top to below sacrificing undercut performance. Maybe they did this to improve airflow going over the top of the side pod. The top of the side pod that forms downwards to the floor have very smooth contours on them signaling low pressure sensitive airflow in this region. This makes for a good case to switch side pod intake position as the edges of an intake will interrupt smooth airflow with flow separation. Having them within the undercut's high pressure region will reduce this sensitivity. Another reason why they possibly made this switch is so it could capture the high pressure from the undercut region and channel this bypass to targeted areas, namely a round area that could influence tunnel exits for improved aerodynamic performance. With the intake on top of the side pods, this would not be a possibility. It is clearly visible here that the vertical air intake is not routed to the cooling system so what does it do? Are they using this bypass undercut pressured air channel to transfer this airflow to influence the top floor exit ramps and beam wing region? The top and rear region of the side pod has taken a very detailed smooth treatment with highly controlled contours by Red Bull Racing and Mercedes AMG on their W15. Maybe we could also add the Ferrari SF24 too. High airflow in this region is significant as it passes the rear suspension to influence beam wings performance. This is also why teams have focused on minimizing rear suspension exposure in this region like on Mercedes AMG's W15 where they have switched to pushrod rear suspension. The W15 is also devoid of a forward position's lower torque arm unlike on the RB20. Indentation volume on top of the side pods is used to guide a vortex that runs next the side pod design to end up within the rear wheels. Again, this is done to minimize rear wheel wake interruption of aerodynamics at the rear. These indentations balances and evens out the undercuts outwash that, if without treatment, would simply guide this vortex outward and away from its intended target. The bulbous shape along the side pod may be there to influence this particular vortex. Aerodynamic heat management is an area where Red Bull Racing has taken things to extremes on the RB20 when comparing to the other cars. Mercedes AMG's technical director James Allison described it as not lightweight nor svelte, but draws his curiosity. Uh, well, um, I, would, I would deeply love to be invited into the Rebel garage and to, to take the engine cover off and delve around under those uh, sort of snorkely things. 
Um, and, and, you know, there is, there is definitely a different approach being taken there because uh, what glimpses you see of their cooling system, it's definitely not light and svelte. So they're doing that for a reason. What they have done is placed as much heat exchanges as possible within the side pods and engine compartment, sacrificing weight and dimensions. We could speculate that the approach they have taken is to have as much core area for heat exchanges as possible allowing it to be even more efficient with heat rejection. Its core has more surface area and more internal liquid volume for thermal exchanges. For a given flow of liquids, the larger core would also slow down liquid within it, further exposing it to cooling properties for a longer period. Simplified, the extended heat exchange efficiency is a trade-off to balance out the inefficiency of an extremely small cooling intake. This rise in thermal efficiency allows for a reduction in intake volume to cool the radiator so more surface area of the RB20 can be used for aerodynamic gains. They have not only doubled up their side pod radiators but added smaller ones behind the driver's helmet to further cooling gains. For the Bahrain Grand Prix, both Fechtstarpen and Perez did not bring up any issues regarding engine temperatures. It was an issue as Toto Wolff and both Williams drivers point out yet cooling intake for their engines on their cars are large than those on the RB20. The engine cover on the RB20 has been called out as a version similar to that previous used by Mercedes-AMG Formula 1 cars before the W15. The W15 now has a minimalist approach in this area instead. Wonder if this is because such a design with all that surfacing might slow down airflow heading towards the rear wing. The one on the RB20 is the largest version of this design so far. Its two cylinder shaped curves that shoulders the top of the engine cover is noticeably larger than any other iteration of this idea. It also ends aggressively, pointing downwards just behind and below the rear wing. The valley on top separates flow between that from the top and the one along the engine cover and side pod. Red Bull Racing has clearly taken advantage of this and selectively split exits from the engine compartment, some on top of the engine cover and others at the rear of the engine cover exits. The total amount of dimensions in extracting air out of the RB20 far exceeds that of its inlet. Eventually, with the radical thermal management done on the RB20, the size of the engine cover is a reflection of this. The minimal inlet forces much more radiators and outlets resulting in having a larger engine cover with a host of methods in aerodynamic thermal management. There is a video of this in this channel where you can click on here to view it. Not much can be said of the underfloor, but around the bib area there are noticeable differences with the bib wing where before on the RB19, it was mounted very low being just above the splitter but on the RB20 they have raised it to the middle of the bib. The RB18 to RB19 floor was revolutionary with complex forms and shapes compared to their contemporaries. The tunnel fences or strakes are stretched with a flick and the end tip. Normally these fences would be of constant radius bends so it could guide outwash as much as possible without any flow separation and shred a vortex along its edge. Red Bull Racing's approach is very different. They have a stretched initial section to work with the extended undercut above it and maintain volume with minimal expansion between itself and the keel which is unlike other designs. Its tip then has another curve that looks more like a vortex generator rather than to simply drive airflow out of the floor exits. The rear end of its central section also closes with little ramps going upwards instead of a smooth closing shape. All the other teams have follow suit. This is clearly done to induce vortex especially when the ramps are placed where the throat area is where airflow here is at its highest velocity within the tunnel. This makes for higher intensity vortex towards the tunnel exits. With the RB19 and also noticeable on later versions of the McLaren MCL60 they even resorted to opening the throat area for a tunnel next to it. This compromises throat area performance via proximity to the ground for this vortex. One would think that as much cross-section of the throat area closer to the ground would give the best performance. This is because the narrower the path the higher airflow velocity would pass this region and maximize low pressure but it looks like they have taken this further. So why are these vortices so important? One way of looking at it is that it behaves as if there is artificial fences within the tunnel exit area or diffuser area. Because the tunnel exits are devoid of diffuser fences, with the two counter-rotating vortices, its flow structure would be similar to that if it had fences. 
This way, just like having fences, the pressure spread throughout the diffuser region would be better. There is also a possibility that what some of these teams are doing is they are taking advantage of the central section of the tunnel. Its proximity to the ground is far superior than that of the highly regulated tunnels that is next to it. This is especially important if they could pull it off. This is because updated regulations has the tunnel throat area raised by 10 mm and floor edges raised 15 mm. This would reduce the tunnel's ground effect performance. The regulations was updated so porpoising would not reach dangerous levels and shake the soul out of the drivers. This is also why we see those curved shapes on the opening section of the RB19's keel area which looks to maintain vortices from whatever created it that is ahead of it. Maybe off the bib wing or some clever designs at the tip of the splitter or even further forward downstream off the undernose to get more energy. These vortices would hug the entire central section of the floor then continue all the way to the tunnel exits, sealing the central section. This is also probably why we can see them running their cars with a little bit of positive rake. This would angle the central section like a very shallow diffuser of its own. Positive rake on a technicality would not be beneficial when running these ground effect tunnels because the throat area where air velocity is at its highest is closer to the rear wheel. Raising the rear ride height will increase this proximity and would reduce tunnel throat area performances, but they are doing it anyway. So this may be the reason why. The raked floor edges would also open up towards the rear where it would be detrimental in sealing the floor. The front nose of the RB20 is quite different to the RB19 in its approach. It loses the RB19's blunt nose tip that works with being detached from the front wing main plane. Instead, Red Bull Racing's approach on the RB20 is to run a sharper, more aerodynamic front nose, but this time it is attached to the front wing main plane. Design of the blunt nose is to create wake that would wedge and force air between the nose tip and front wing main plane. This would create high velocity on the undernose while the shape under the nose and main plane could work together to further guide airflow upwards instead of being more sensitive to flow separation. This means that they can apply more angular undernose designs. From the onset, it seems like the RB20's sharper front nose design is done to clean the airflow underneath and generally around the front nose region. This is probably why the midsection of the front nose has a more shallow curve before expanding upward some more. This would then contribute to improve airflow towards the ground effect tunnel entrances where the bib and splitter is, and also top floor aerodynamic performances. With their previous design on the RB19, maybe they were trying to get the front nose tip region to contribute to some downforce in order to reduce front wing aspect ratio airflow for a given amount of total front downforce. The split main plane together with a more rounded nose tip however would not gain smoother airflow towards the tunnel entrances and instead encourage airflow to stay attached and conform with the shape of the undernose. In this image, it makes for a case for this that the Flovis markings show more airflow from the undernose being redirected to the top of the floor entry on the RB20 compared to the RB19. It also shows how much wake is generated by the ground effect floor that it may not work as a complete ventory as thought. Considering how much work is done to extract airflow from the rear of the tunnels, this should not be happening. It can clearly be seen that a lot of air is flowing into the undercut and also where the vertical intake is positioned. Improved airflow approaching this region would certainly enhance underfloor and over-the-floor aerodynamic performances.